out of every adjective that I thought I needed to describe this movie. Surprisingly relevant was definitely not one of them. Happy New Year, everyone. Oh, you didn't know? It's no rules, the Persian New Year, and it's the year 1401. So I am firmly and confidently in the, the new, new century. century. Here in the future, things still suck. Climate change is still a huge issue. Henry Kissinger is still alive, and Jeremy Irons still hasn't been recognized fully as our Lord and Savior, by the majority of the human population. Honestly, I am disappointed in humanity, but I'm not alone. So is Jafar Khan. Who is Jafar Khan? Well, he's the protagonist of a comedy called Jafar Khan as Farang Bargashte, roughly translated to Jafar Khan has returned from abroad, released in 1988 in Iran. Who wrote him? Well, he's based on a play written in 1921. Oh, 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 who wrote the movie? If you consult the movie's credits and poster, the answer is nobody. Oh, and nobody produced the movie and nobody directed it. I'm not joking. The opening and closing credits of the movie have no name for writer, producer, and director. Thankfully though, we have an understanding of what happened to the movie thanks to interviews and some published material. But <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves. The interesting thing about the movie, aside from everything surrounding its creation, is how it paints a picture that was surprisingly relevant for its time, and even relevant now. It tells us about the perception of Iranian public on educated classes returning from abroad, and the effects of a diminishing image of experts due to a history of apathy and ineptitude. Before we get to any of them, though, it's important to go to the movie and understand what is happening in it. So, come and join me as we do just that. This is a half scene, by the way. Uh, it's a traditional thing we have. And uh, it has one of the stupidest joke I've ever heard associated with it. And I love it. The joke is... Uh, I was trying to explain half seen to my English speaking friend and I said it's seven things that start with an S like Apple. I love that joke. I really love that joke. I, I think you know by now that I am a huge fan of stupid comedy and this is the stupidest kind. But it's actually f sort of true <laughs> uh, because the it is seven things that start with an S. The Persian word starts with S. It's a spread of seven things, and usually it's uh, Sib, Sir, Somak, Serke, Senjed, Sabze, Samanu. And then there is this other thing. I've only seen it done in Azeri household, in uh, Turkish people of the north west of Iran, and it's lentils and rice. I've never seen it done anywhere else. We also have colored eggs, candle, mirror, and some coins. The coins, which we call seke, can actually be part of the half scene, but here it's just an added part. And we also have like divan hafiz. So yeah, this is a quick review for those of you who don't know why am I sitting next to a bunch of seemingly random things. <laughs> Okay, let's get this away and off we go. For we 
reasons that will be apparent later in the video, I need to go through the movie almost scene by scene for you to understand what is happening in it. The movie is quite incoherent and messy, but there is a reason for that. I don't recommend checking this movie out, but out of obligation, here's the time code you need to go to in order to avoid spoilers. Or go to the next chapter. Our movie begins with Hajak Barcheloui talking to Dr. Sharif about his son, Jafar. Jafar is apparently returning to Iran after studying abroad for a few years. With some very clunky exposition, we realize that Jafar has an invitation from the Iranian government, but his father talks about how he has bought a land and has called it Jafar Abad for Jafar to return and use it for his work. He then tells the doctor to come to his house later that day for the return of Jafar. He then goes around town buying fruit and sweets for the welcome party. We realize that he is going to get Jaffa to marry his cousin. <laughs> and we meet his extended family concerning, sorry, consisting of his daughter and granddaughter, proofreading the script as I'm recording. All of them anxiously waiting for the return of Jaffa. We also learned that Jafar's mother has passed away quite recently, but they haven't told him about it. Hajakpar then goes to work at his restaurant. There, we meet his employees, who are his son-in-law and his late wife's brother. The restaurant opened for business, and here we meet another doctor by the name of Dr. Khoshtel. He is in charge of the local clinic and is a good friend of Haj Akbar. <laughs> Here we learn that the reason Haj Akbar hasn't relayed his wife's death to Jafar was that he was worried that the stress might result in him abandoning his studies and returning to Iran a year earlier. Later that day, Haj Akbar goes to the airport for Jafar's arrival and sees him wearing rather unconventional clothing and owning a dog on a leash. To Haj Akbar's surprise, there is a governmental welcoming committee for Jafar and though Haj Akbar tells Jafar that his family are waiting for him at home, Jafar decides to go with the welcoming committee to a celebration thrown in his honor. Haj Akbar goes home despondent. In the way there, he buys some toys for his granddaughter and frames it as the toys coming from Jaffa. In the house, he talks with his daughter and voices concerns about Jaffa's behavior and changes. Then we have a scene where Haj Akbar and his brother-in-law go to an asylum where Dr. Khoshtel works and give fruits and sweets to people there. Honestly, despite the problems with the movie that we will get to down the line, this scene a still feels out of left field. Haj Akbar then goes to the hotel where they are throwing a celebration for Jaffa with his brother-in-law and son-in-law. There, Jafar is asked to give a speech. He takes the stand and talks about his plans. He spouts a lot of pseudo-futuristic talk where he claims that he is the sole cure for everything wrong, not only with Iran, but with the world. So all, Khorshid Kei Khamush Mi Shabbat? جواب روشن از فردا بله فردا فردا زمستان سختی در پیش است سرما و تاریکی ای گله یخزده در سرد خانه پهناور زمین دلگرم باش که درمان آمده He also lays out his plan for taking inexperienced workers and training them for work in space 
This movie was an absurd comedy when it came out. Haj Akbar instructs his brother-in-law that they should take Jaffa back home, and they do so. In the house, Haj Akbar starts berating Jaffa on how much he's changed and calls him out on his insensitive behavior for not coming home instantly, wearing odd clothes, and not asking about his mother at all. Jafar asks for his pet dog to be let in for the night, and Hajakpa tells him that if he wants his pet, he should sleep outside, which he does. Tomorrow, Hajakpa takes Jafar to his mother's grave, and there Jafar continues his odd behavior by serenading his mother's tombstone from afar. They then go back home, and Jafar talks with his sister, criticizing the home's architecture and asking for foreign things like coffee instead of the traditional tea. Both are bad drinks, don't drink them. Hajakba then says that for the family gathering, he will not let them see Jafar until he sees feet. Later, during the family's gathering, he starts telling lies about Jafar and painting a picture of him as a compassionate son who asked about his mother first and then cried extensively at her grave. Meanwhile, Jafar and his uncle are on top of the rooftop, and Jafar shows that he has a governmental decree to start working on his projects. He appoints his uncle as his second in command and tasks him with doing the manual labor and protecting him. He calls his project, which is supposed to happen in Jafarabad, the futuristic village of New Jeff. <laughs> I'm going to give a quick review at the end of this chapter for the movie, but this joke is still funny to me. He then talks to his father and tells him about the governmental decree, and his father breaks him again and tells him that he wishes for Jafar to settle down and marry his cousin. Jafar then informs his father that while he was abroad, he had married and also has a kid. His father, upon hearing the news, has a stroke and passes out. Jaffa takes his father and the son-in-law and decides to bring his father to Dr. Khoshdel's asylum and frame him as mentally challenged instead of taking him to the hospital. But when Dr. Khoshdel sees him there, he realizes something is wrong and goes to the clinic's administration, administration, I'm sorry, and tells him that they should send Haj Akbar to a hospital, and so Haj Akbar is sent to the hospital under the care of Dr. Sharif. With his father out of the way, Jaffa starts working on New Jeff, gathering a number of local farmers and introducing them to a bunch of farming machinery and giving them speeches about how he's, how he's going to change the future. In the hospital, Hajakbar daughter come to visit him, and he can barely speak the name of Jaffa, telling her sort of what happened. Jaffa then presents his workers with his ultra-futuristic gear and starts filming them for a presentation, showing his inventions and progression to the government. One of the progressions being that he wishes to teach English to these workers and have them conduct business in space. Thank you very much, Mr. Sahab Super. Ah. Very tasty. I am seeing. I am seeing. Shut up! Ah, hello, Mashose. Hello, Mr. Golumi. Meanwhile, Hajakpar is not seeing much improvement, so Dr. Shaif and Hajakpar's daughter relay him to Dr. Khoshtel, who tries to help him gain mobility, and realizes that Jafar's betrayal is still heavy on Hajakpar's mind. He asks Dr. Sharif to go and speak with Jafar, which he does. Dr. Sharif berates Jafar for lying to people, that he actually has a number of degrees, and tells him that he also studied abroad and whatever Jaffa is saying is mostly nonsense. 
تو واقعا دروغای خودت باور کرده ای مرد حسابی منم تو همون مملکتی درس خوندم که تو خونده ای برای خوندن و گذروندن این همه رشته و تخصص که تو اسم میبری بیشتر از صد سال وقت لازمه تو مسائل جهشی پرشی رو نمیدونی جانم به تو زیادی پریدی جعفر He tells Jaffa that the future cannot happen without looking back at the past. Remember that. He then tells Jaffa that he needs to visit his father, which he refuses. Dr. Sharif then talks with Hajakpa's daughter and says that maybe if Hajakpa sees his granddaughter, it might help him. So they bring his granddaughter to visit him, and when he thinks that she might be in danger, he gains all mobility and is fully cured. Back in New Jeff, though, things aren't going according to plan. Jaffa's workers are laying around with no purpose, and some of the neighboring village kids, angry at Jaffa for ruining their playground, have started to mutiny against him. They run after him and beat him up. That night, Jaffa, seemingly out of his mind due to sickness, starts a long speech in the rain, with his uncle as the only listener. من که سباد ندارم دایی میفهمی چه میگویی چه دانشی بالاتر از چشم جهان بین بنگر بی کردی خواهی فهمی اینجا نبشته است نبشته است من من برگ چنارم He braids his way of thinking and says that he should have looked at Iranian traditions and tried to use them to advance in his project. Also remember that. But then during the next um, day, week, I'm not sure how long has passed, he decides to leave Iran. He says that his genius is too much for the Iranian public, and why would he try to work with them when foreign countries would be more inclined to celebrate him and his work? So he leaves Iran, and Hajakba promptly, sort of, disowns him and gives new Jeff to Dr. Khoshtel, who turns it into a local clinic. Hajakba then asks Dr. Sharif to join Dr. Khoshtel in the clinic, and the movie ends. A few notes before we go forward. First off, if you were an Iranian and saw this opening credit... <laughs> and thought it sounds suspiciously like this one. You're onto something because they are both composed by the same guy, Murtaza Hanane. Secondly, during the clips you might have noticed that some characters do speak with an accent. The movie takes place in the city of Isfahan, and many of the main characters, excluding Jafar himself, speak with an Isfahani accent. It varies in quality though, while there are a number of Isfahani actors who speak the lines with an acceptable accent, Ezzatullah Entezami and Ira Jawad, who portrayed Hajak Chelui and Dr. Sharif respectively, did not. How, how would I know? I, I am from Isfahan. I was born there and my paternal family is Isfahani. So, you know, I know how to speak in this accent and the fact that none of these Isfahani-born actors told this to that their accents are downright embarrassing is a shame. <laughs> With these two notes out of the way, I hope I managed to show you the messiness of the movie. It falls apart pretty quickly and there are scenes that are needlessly melodramatic and sentimental which clashes hard with the overall absurdity that this comedy is trying to achieve. About the comedy aspect of it, aside from a few visual jokes like Jafar Khan's new Jeff attire or his uncle doing some weird stuff, most of the comedy of the movie comes from its audience's relationship with it. Meaning, it's not really jokes that are being said, but the audience are supposed to see the correlation with people who speak like this 
and promise dumbfounded ideas as life-saving. I think there is a word for it, um, satire. But what is this movie satirizing? For that, I need to explain a whole lot of Iranian history and the Iranians' relationship with a class of educated people who overpromised a lot of stuff and underdelivered in appearance. That also shows itself in why the movie's narrative is such a mess, which we will get to eventually. It would take a lot of time to do that though, so we better start. <laughs> This is both a bit tangential and a bit necessary for understanding the point of this video. Before we go on to discuss the development and the release of the movie, we have to talk a little bit about Iranian history. I think everything that happened in 20th century in Iran, whether politically, socially or culturally, has been either a prelude or under the influence of the Persian Constitutional Revolution of 1905. It's the single defining moment that shaped a lot of what we consider to be Iran in the present, and that includes the Islamic Revolution of 1979. So in order for us to have a frame of reference, I think we need to build a timeline. Our timeline needs to have a peak called the Constitutional Revolution because, as I said, that was like a really big deal. Then we need to have a smaller peak down the line called the Islamic Revolution of 1979. I've written 1997 for some reason. It's the year I was born, not the, not the year that the Islamic Revolution happened which is going to be our end point for reasons that will become more clear as we go on. So before the constitutional revolution, we have the modernization of Iran, and after it, we have what I have poetically named the broken promises. I'm not going to eat a pistachio because I hate this stuff. This is exciting, people. For the first time in the history of AK-88 Studios, Please welcome our inaugural intersection, our fundamental fraction, our maiden momentary pause, our first ever subchapter, the modernization of Iran. Except, uh, before that we need a prelude. The current Iranian regime that you can see on the news is what is called the Islamic Republic, or IR for short. Before the current regime, Iran had a long and semi-proud tradition of monarchy. But the immediate prequel to IR was the Pahlavi dynasty, or what some older viewers might call the Shah of Iran, or this guy. His father, Reza Shah, got the Pahlavi dynasty started in 1925 with a coup d'etat in 1921. We'll get there, don't worry. Before them, though, the ruling regime over Iran was the Qajar dynasty, which started their reign in 1789. Before them is not really important, because our story begins with the second king in the Qajar dynasty, a man by the name of Fathali Shah. Okay, bring in the subchapter now. During the late 18th century, in 1797, Fatali Shah Qajar became the king of Persia, consisting of modern-day Iran and some other modern-day countries. Just a side note, I'm going to use the words Persia and Iran interchangeably, which will annoy some people. But note that they both talk about the same country and region in the world. In Fatali Shah's time, Persia got invaded by Russia after they annexed a part of it. You know what I love? The escapism of researching these topics and making these videos. In this war, which started from 1804 until 1813, Persia lost a huge chunk of land and realized a simple fact. Persia is severely underdeveloped 
and extremely behind in both military, science, and culture. Then Fatah Ali Shah attacked the Russians in 1826 and this time lost a bunch more land, but it's not important. The important thing is, Iran was handed a wake-up call by this war. There needed to be incredible advances done to the infrastructure of Iran and Iranians were in dire need of modernization. Now, this is when you would have a very slow movement that includes a lot of slow policies and education. But nope, this is Iran and under the Qajar dynasty. Let me explain. The bulk of our discussion are not about Fatah Ali Shah himself, but about two other kings. His great-grandson, Nasruddin Shah Qajar, and his majestic mustache, and Nasruddin Shah's son, Muzaffaruddin Shah Qajar, and his somehow more magnificent mustache. Now, these two men were responsible for Iran from 1848 until 1907. Most of his was Nasruddin Shah, though. Muzaffaruddin Shah was famously short-lived in his tenure as the king. A sort of Prince Charles situation, if you will, where you hang around waiting for your parents to die. Modernization of Iran sort of would happen like this then. The Persian king would go on a tour of visiting European countries. They would realize their equipment and their ideas are a lot more outdated than they thought. So they would purchase new equipment and return home and try to implement those ideas that they saw or the very misguided understandings of them in Iran without any regards for the cultural tapestry of Iran or how it would impact the future generations. For example, Muzaffaruddin Shah Qajar famously bought a film camera in France and brought it home, but didn't use it for anything other than a very expensive toy. So they decided the best way to advance the Iranian public is to do it their way, but in a more grand scale. So they would send Iranians outside of Iran, have them study abroad, and then come back to help with modernization of Iran. This usually meant that people who were sent abroad get to see a lot of advancements done by people in other countries. Then returning home and seeing their own um, primitive society in comparison, and trying to implement those advancements by force. That lovely struggle is the origins of an emergence of a new class of people called Roshan Fekr. Now, people usually translate Roshan Fekr as intellectual, but I humbly disagree with that translation. Though the term intellectual is ambiguous, I think it's not ambiguous enough to refer to Roshan Fekr, because it might give the imp slight impression that the movement surrounding the Roshan Fekh class was not only structured, that it was defined. Because it was neither. There are official definitions for Roshan Fekh, but even those are insufficient because the term changes definition when it comes to contact with other classes. A political Roshan Fekh does not have social, political, or even ideological similarities with a Roshan Fekh artist. So the term is not defined. That's why I propose using the term enlightened to translate Roshan Fake because that way we have a very ambiguous term that doesn't really have a good definition. And it also pinpoints the only thing similar between everyone in it, the supposed opposition to traditionalism. Traditionalism. This is gonna be a long journey. <laughs> So from now on, I'm going to use the term enlightened for this class, because this is my video and I can do whatever I want. These enlightened people, as mentioned before, were not really defined by an ideology or an understanding. The term was widely misused to the point of losing all comprehension. Among politicians, the enlightened were anti-monarchy. It meant that as long as they opposed monarchy to some extent, they were considered amongst the enlightened. So someone like Muhammad Ali Furuqi, who did a lot of legislation 
to actually advance Iranian culture and help to keep Iran unified is on the same class as Sayyid Jamaluddin Asadabadi, a dude who ordered another dude to kill the king. The same disparity is also apparent in the enlightened class in artists, writers, journalists, and other groups of people. But this enlightened had an effect on people. A lot of them were going to study abroad using government money, so they had the ease of mind to actually look at the advancement of society where they were studying and then bringing a lot of those ideas and advancements home. So they were hailed as harbingers of modernization by both the government, who was hoping to have a return on the investment they made, and the general public, who was intrigued by their words. They managed to bring ideas like liberation, secularism, women's rights, free press, classicism, and educational reform to the general public, and they were met with a lot of mixed reactions. On one hand, their ideas for political reform and liberation were met with a lot of positive feedback. After all, the Qajar dynasty was not very popular with the people, and some incidents involving the opposition of the state and the religious foundations of the country that was caused by the aforementioned travels of the king had made the Qajar dynasty seem opposed to fundamental Iranian values. Also, you can look up tobacco protests for some of the political reasons too. On the other hand, there are ideas for actually reforming a lot of traditions, like the suppression of women under the rule of religion, or the abundance of influence of the clerics, were met with less than welcome reactions. Iranian culture at the time was heavily embedded with traditionalism. So opposing that traditionalism became sort of a rite of passage for the enlightened. People like Ali Akbar Dehkhoda, Sadiq Hidayat, Mirzadi Ishqi, and the aforementioned Muhammad Ali Furuqi were staunchly against a lot of traditions that held the belief that the current situation of Iran is the will of God. And so changing a lot of the fundamentals of it would mean going against it. In short, people knew something was wrong and they understood that their lives were not improving. But they weren't really ready to face the roots of these problems and affecting them in a meaningful way. Again, the escapism in is the most fun part of these videos. <laughs> So they did the second best thing they could. A revolution! The Constitutional Revolution of 1905 is a magnificent mess that would take hours to fully explain. So this is a criminally abridged version of it. I highly recommend if you are interested in Iranian politics and history to read up on it. It's, again, Magnificent. The Enlightened had given people the understanding that the total monarchy of Qajar dynasty, which was riddled with corruption, lack of oversight, and gross nepotism, was not the only way to govern. They told people tales of other forms of governance that meant people would have a more active role in deciding their own fate. And the idea of a constitution, which meant that everyone from king to the village elder, would be under the rule of law, and it would secure rights for every citizen. Ideas that for people who were very unhappy with the king seemed incredibly appealing. So people started asking for those things in their lives. They literally started asking for a constitution. This is a bit of a language fun. The name we give to this revolution in Persian is Mashrute. But that is a name given to it by historians. The actual people who did it were calling for a constitution, not a Mashrute. So they began protesting. The merchants closed down shops. The villagers and farmers went to their local mosques and started a strike. 
and people went to seek asylum from foreign embassies. They started to demand constitutional rights and everything that it promised. All of this happened under the rule of Muzaffaruddin Shah Qajar, a notoriously disinterested king. Again, he spent like most of his life sick and in waiting of the throne. So when he got it, he wasn't really into governance as he was into touring Europe, playing with his toys. He gave huge concessions to foreign powers in order to fund these tours and toys and that meant a lot of unrest amongst a lot of people in his circle. So when he saw people are asking for a constitution, in his credit, he gave it to them. He signed the constitution in 1906 and died a year later. So people have won. Sort of. You see, the thing about wanting something without addressing a lot of the underlying issues is that you just get a new coat of paint on those problems, and nothing changes. Iranians finally got a parliament, but not in the way they hoped for. You see, part of the reason people were asking for a constitution was a traditional way of governance in Iran, which meant that the king stood on top, but each region had a pseudo-ruler, and each village had a pseudo-ruler, it was basically a feudal system without the efficiency. So a lot of people were tired of being in the pockets of the landowners and the village elders, as well as an inept king. But when the parliament takes shape, those same landowners were the people who were choosing their parliament members. They had the wealth that they had gathered, some of them still had the support of many traditionalists who were seeing the constitution as a western weapon to destroy their religion, and many of them had the influence to hold the fact that they were still landowners over people that occupied their lands. You see, Iranians got a parliament, but forgot to take away the rights of landowners, village elders, and regional government. So nothing changed. It just added a wrinkle to the system of oppression that now meant they didn't even realize who were to blame. Because this was what they wanted. Then there's this fucker. But we're not going to talk about him. Fuck him, actually. He single-handedly added an amendment to make sure religious traditionalism still had a firm foot in the parliament. So, you know, like, fuck him. But people were promised change. And when that didn't come, they started to blame the people who had promised them the change. It's a cycle. People were promised more freedom, and they wanted that promise. But achieving that meant moving away from traditionalism and changing the fundamental rules of Iranian culture, and that was too much to ask. So when they ultimately, and quite inevitably, failed to secure the freedom they wanted, they started to feel cheated, and the Enlightened went from being the harbinger of change to people who only talked and did not deliver. That claim has stuck around since then, and the reasoning is not really unfounded. But at the same time, it is incredibly unfair. I'll return to this point, so just put a pin in it and keep it in the back of your head. After the revolution, some huge flaws started to show themselves. The biggest one being that people have really settled for far less political power than they thought they were given. You see, the constitution of 1906 had a tiny problem. It only worked if the king at the time was willing to humor it. So when Muzaffaruddin Shah died in 1907 and was replaced by his son, Muhammad Ali Shah Qajar, and his arguably less magnificent mustache, he took advantage of it. Hard. He bombarded the parliament in 1908. 
that is not a name for a swift or brutish political move. He literally pointed cannons at the parliament building and shot cannonballs at it. Politics is fucking fun sometimes. His move made way for the second constitutional um, revolution. I mean, it was mostly a constitutional invasion. Forces from around Tehran advanced into it and deposed the king and replaced him with his 11-year-old kid, Ahmad Shah Qajar. And that went as well as you thought it would. Gross nepotism returned, traditionalism returned to its place, enlightened tried to warn people of separatism and the possible division of Persia, and people didn't listen to them. The enlightened promised them constitution, and it didn't happen. And the only change that actually seemed to happen came from local khans and military brutes. So, why would people listen to the enlightened anymore. This is very depressing. I know studying history is depressing when you realize nothing has changed fundamentally, but this is exceptionally depressing. <laughs> so, lo and behold, a lot of separatist movements emerged and Iran was on the verge of collapse until a military coup d'etat was done in 1901 and it forced Ahmad Shah to appoint Reza Khan as his prime minister, who later officially ended the Qajar dynasty by forcing the parliament to diplomacy to make him the king. And thus was born the Pahlavi dynasty. I'm, I'm not going to talk about Reza Shah Pahlavi for much, because it is inevitable that some Iranians will see this video at some point, and the discourse around this guy has turned ultra-toxic. You haven't seen the ire of a fandom until Iranian dude bros come for you when you talk about, about the role model. The guy who was arguably a fuck, and all the good things he allegedly did was spearheaded by other people whom he later either killed or pushed aside. But I digress. For our purposes, the view that Reza Shah had on the Enlightened was that they talk too much and put ideas in the head of people. And so they should shut the fuck up. He was happy to accommodate them if they were unwilling to do so on their own accord. Reza Shah was then deposed in the Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran in 1941 because this supposedly good king, supported fucking Hitler. His son, Mohammad Reza Shah, was then crowned. Now, under Reza Shah's reign, the Enlightened had lost a lot of power, and his son sort of continued that tradition. So, the Enlightened became what many considered them to be, a group of educated people who mostly talk about reformation, but had no idea how to actually implement those reformations. That's why in Muhammad Reza's time, they mostly took the form of poets and journalists, and not politicians or legislatures. With the inability of the Enlightened to actually change anything, came a dangerous opposition to them in the form of religious traditionalism. As the Enlightened became more savage in their opposition to traditionalism, the memory of the Constitutional Revolution, as well as the rise of Reza Shah, who at the time did a lot of unpopular reforms, these court marks are doing a lot of heavy lifting here, made it seem like that the traditionalism is the way to go. The rise of traditionalism meant that the new movements trying to revolutionize the people had to have a sort of traditionalist coat on them. Religious intellectual became a thing. The clerics started to be seen as the true opposition of the monarchy and the old enlightened ideas of liberation and the dangers of traditionalism became a punching bag for many of the new rising political powers and all of that came to head in the Islamic Revolution of 1979. 
By the time of the revolution and the enactment of Islamic Republic, the enlightened were mostly a dying breed. Soon the term itself lost all meaning as a class of people and was replaced by a myriad of other terms like intellectual, which we call intellect, and artsy. The enlightened just drifted away. A lot of their ideas nowadays are still prominent, but with the advancement of information, they are now having their proper definitions and are not bound to I saw this thing in this other country and it looked good. Remember the pin I told you? Let me refresh your memory. The enlightened were regarded as the answer to the rapidly backwards ideal of Iranians in the later 19th century. Both the government who sent them abroad to study and the people who stood by them to hear their words did make them appear as they are supposed to modernize Iran overnight. And the enlightened believed them. It's eerie to look at Muhammad Ali Afuruqi's speeches, or read Sadiq Hedayat's stories, or read Mirza De Eshqi's poem, and realize that these people were incredibly ahead of their times. They had huge plans for advancements and realized the true dangers of traditionalism and blindly following it. I did say it was depressing to research this topic because you can see how easily they were defeated and then were laid aside for big traditionalist ideals to take their place because of how inept they were in actually convincing people to follow them. Forced modernization is rarely going to help when the infrastructure is not there to support it. As I mentioned, Iran had a film camera in 1900, but the first Iranian movie did not come out until 1930, and it was a silent movie. For comparison, in 1930, the movie All Quiet on the Western Front came out, and Iran had its first silent movie. You see, camera was a toy. It was a tool of modernization that was bought and brought to Iran, but the understanding of it took another three decades to establish, and even then, people were not still ready to embrace it. Actors and actresses were ostracized constantly and harassed. So yeah, the enlightened were ahead of their time, but with how they wanted to change everything from the outside, they were bound to faceplant. And they did. Now, you might be saying, Ali, all of this story stuff is boring. What the fuck does it have to do with the mediocre comedy from 1980s? Well, you see, the way Jafar Khan is and the way he's supposed to be mirrors the image of Enlightened. He is regarded either as too revolutionary to be taken seriously or is hailed as a true master that will overnight change everything. And he's not. He understands there is something wrong, but he can't understand why. Because though he has studied abroad, he has only seen the surface. Funny thing is, the movie itself is kind of following those footprints too. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You thought we were done with history? You were wrong! These three books are here to help us in order to paint a picture. If you recall way back in the intro, I mentioned that the movie is based on a play. The play, titled Jafar Khan as Farang Amade, was a one-act comedy written by Hassan Muqaddam in the year 1921, but it was debuted on stage on March 29, 1922. Yes, it's the 100-year anniversary of the play. Okay, um, here at the beginning of it, they have like uh, a certificate for when it was when it was first debuted on stage, um, and it says on the night of 8th of Hamal 1301, 
uh, which, and I know this is different, don't, don't attack me, people who know this, uh, Hamal is roughly the same as Farvardin, which is the first month of spring in Iran, and so this is an eighth of that, which is weird because uh, according to a website that calculates all of this, uh, it's March 29th, 1922, but since this, is, this was after the leap year uh, this year, it's March 28th on this year, Faradin. Uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's just that, yep, 100-year-old play. I recently bought and read the play, now, this is of course a reprint, and I don't have a very rare historical document sitting on my table, but they claim that they have kept the original structure and even tried to keep the typing similar, and I am kind of inclined to believe them. <laughs> it's a 100-year-old play, and it's weird how much the Persian language has changed. One of the reasons I don't like to call what Iranians talk with Farsi is that I don't think it is Farsi. I tend to think of Farsi as the language used mostly in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. The difference is that the Iranian language, Persian, used to be Farsi. Farsi is more structured and more historically accurate. But Persian is a mixed language. It has bits of English, Arabic, Turkish, French, and many more languages as its formal aspect. I digress, but looking at this play, it's odd to see how the early Persian plays were written and structured. There are a lot of both French words and Arabic words in it. But the first thing that caught my eye while reading the play, aside from the language and the date of its first production, is the story. Now remember, this play came out in 1922, which is in that weird place where the Enlightened haven't lost all of their appeal and all of their power, but at the same time, it is obvious that their way of integrating into society is not ideal. The story of the play shows Jafar Khan, the guy returning from France, I'm sure, because there are a lot of French words like Merci beaucoup, to be somewhat of a progressive force with certain obsessive behaviors, and is shown to be a true adversary for the antagonist of the play, which is the superstitions and the outdated traditions of the Iranian public at the time. It does have some dramatic exaggeration, but in the play, Jafar Khan returns to France because he cannot fathom some of the ideas that were prominent in mostly mercantile and higher economic level classes of Iranian public. And by looking at some of the reviews that this book has gathered in, its, in the epilogue, many of the critics of 1922 also saw the play as a newfangled guy coming and facing with a rapidly culturally underdeveloped Iranian elite. But we have the luxury of time. And how the face of dramatic storytelling has changed. And by looking at the play, and this could have been a coincidence or a clever commentary, we realize that Jafar Khan is kind of a dumbass. He has seen a lot of advancements in France that were lacking in 1922 Iran, like personal hygiene and an avid theater scene, and a steady movement away from superstitions, but he hasn't understand them or how they clash with his nationality. At the beginning of the play, we see Jafar Khan opening a newspaper and claiming that Iran has progressed a bit. What are his reasons for this claim? The newspaper says that some guy who was illiterate has been put in charge of digging qanats in Kerman. So he only saw the overly formal words that they have used in the newspaper and didn't understand the underlying problem that digging more granites for water is an inefficient way and Iran needs to update the technology to get the water. He later reads in the same newspaper that articles are written per request, meaning you pay the newspaper to write an article about you. And he calls it Iran's getting lawful. So yeah, it seems 
the enlightened Jafar Khan in the play is not the brightest or as enlightened as he wants to be. Side note, there is this joke in the play that even after 100 years since it first appeared made me chuckle. There's this scene between Jafar Khan, his mother, and his cousin, and he says, we Parisians. And his mother says, he's from Sangalaj, uh, which is an old neighborhood in Tehran, and he calls himself Parisian. It made me chuckle. It's uh, one of those, it's funny because it's two situations. <laughs> and it's a joke that has been told in some capacity throughout the years, both as an honest critique and a way for traditionalists to disregard change. <laughs> so it's fun to see this joke has a long and proud history. <laughs> now, reading the play, it's kind of obvious that when Ali Hatami decided to make the movie adaptation in the 1980s, he decided to make Jafar Khan into a true dumbass. We'll get to what that means a bit later, but first let's talk about why the movie is so misguided. This is the biography of the late Muhammad Ali Keshavaz. He was an actor and an oddly prolific one, working with directors ranging from older school Iranian authors to the independent art groups. In this book, they have a few interviews with him that have been published before. He talks about his life a bit, and it has what I consider to be the treasure trove. The book goes through his filmography, movie by movie, giving the information available on them, and newspaper clippings, magazine reviews, and Keshavaz's own recollections of it. It is a treasure trove because Iran has an abysmal archival system. And so a lot of these stories and clippings and reviews get lost in the archives and sometimes are just destroyed out of incompetence. So having a good archive of even one actor's filmography is really good. And this book has become frustratingly rare too. So I'm kind of lucky to have it. This book is actually one of my first book hunts. Like, uh, I know the guy, I knew the guy, and I loved him, and I knew of the book's existence, but it was out of print, I think. I bought it a decade ago. Like, this book is a decade old. And so, at that time, the Iranian book online scene was not very prominent, so I had to go book hunting by going to bookshop to bookshop and asking if they have this. I think I managed to find it in a small bookstore in one of the side alleys of Engalab. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Engalab Street and the Engalab Square is sort of the cultural hub of Tehran. There are an outrageous number of uh, bookstores and publication offices there, as well as a university, the Tehran University, you know, the one with the famous archers. It's our McDonald. And it is as efficient as a real McDonald in turning out qualified university students. Come at me, Tehran University students. <laughs> highly specific, highly specific regional shade. <laughs> in here, there is an entry for Jafar Khan as Frank Bergeshte. We have four different accounts of what happened. One from Ali Hatami, one from Muhammad Mutawassalani, one from Abdullah Esfandiari, and one from Muhammad Ali Keshavaz. I know I just threw a lot of names at you, but I will explain them in length, so don't worry. It will all make sense. You don't need to know the intricacies of each different account because each person has tried to tell the story in a way that favors them, but there are similar elements in each recollection, which is where we can build our case. The Ali Hatami, Muhammad Mutawassalani, and Abdullah Esfandiari accounts are from a film magazine issue in 1990, two years after the movie had came out. I tried to find that issue, but as I said, the Iranian archival system is a mess. I couldn't even find it on the film magazine website. But thankfully, the book has all three accounts in it. 
the Muhammad Ali Keshavaz one was done for his book specifically. But here's the story of what happened. In the early 1980s, after the Islamic Revolution, Ali Hatami decided to adapt the play Jafar Khan as Farang into a comedy movie. Now, I talked in length about Ali Hatami in my two-parter about Iranian cinema back in the days of Born in Quarantine, and I suggest you check it out for an overview of the Iranian cinema. But the important thing to remember is that Ali Hatami was kind of a power force in Iranian cinema, and he had a very distinctive style in writing. I can't believe I have to drink this shit. Oh my god, this is so bad. Why, why do you people drink tea? The early post-Islamic revolution days in Iran were not very favorable to comedies. So this movie was made with that mindset. And it was very conservative in how it tells its jokes. In 1985, the movie is made, written and directed by Ali Hatemi and starring Azatullah Entezami, Hussein Sarsha, Reza Alham Saad, and Muhammad Ali Keshavaz. It was produced by Ali Abbasi, a continuous partner of Ali Hatemi for a long time, and it was never released. You see, Iranian cinema does not have free expression. Everything that needs to be released and shown on a silver screen needs to be subjected to guidelines. Think of it as an Iranian version of the Hayes Code in America and government sanctioned. So the censors didn't approve of the movie in its final form and they told Ali Hatami that if he wants to show the movie, he needs to change the full third act, which he promptly refused to do so. <laughs> Here the movie sort of enters a development limbo. Abdullah Esfandiari, who was part of the censors review board and the head of Farabi Cinema's foundation's cultural development, it means nothing, it means nothing basically. <laughs> decides that in order for the capital that has been put into the film to be reimbursed, reimbursed to Ali Abbasi, they need to reshoot some stuff and basically change the movie. A quick side note here, he says the reason that the movie was rejected was it was a cheap comedy. I will get to why I think that is kind of a surface level excuse in the next chapter, but with where the Iranian cinema ended up, that comment is painfully ironic. I'm not saying Jafar Khanas Frank Bagheshte was a masterpiece, but that a movie being rejected for being a cheap comedy is something that will make anyone who is familiar with the most outputs of Iranian cinema chuckle a little. <laughs> Abdullah Esfandiari first calls up Ali Hatami, and he refuses to return and change the movie, but he agrees, verbally, for someone else to change the movie only if they agree to keep his name off of the credits. Abdullah Esfandiari then calls up a number of other directors who all refuse. Well, almost all. <laughs> Muhammad Mutawassalani is one of those Iranian directors who lacks a distinctive style, but his movies are kind of part of the backbone of Iranian cinema's narrative. If I were to compare him to an international equivalent, it would be people like Ron Howard. Not terrible directors per se, but honestly not very significant outside of their individual movies. He made movies like uh, Kafshai Mirza Nouruz, roughly translated to Mirza Nouruz's Shoes, uh, which is okay, give it a watch if you have the means to. He was apparently trying to help Ali Abbasi get his lost capital on the movie. He first tried to pass the job to other people, but when nobody agreed to do it, he came on the job himself. He used 48 minutes of footage from Ali Hatami's version of the movie and wrote and directed around 40 minutes of new footage to be inserted between those sections. 
out of the original actors, Ezzatullah Entezami, Hussein Sarsha, and Reza Alhamsad, and some other bit players returned. Muhammad Ali Keshawaz, out of a sense of loyalty to Ali Hatami, did not. There were also new actors and parts added to the movie, including Ira Jarad, Sarwar Najatullahi, and Golnush Entezami. So Muhammad Mutawassalani basically made his own version of the movie and spliced it into Ali Hatami's version. There are some recreated scenes that try to use the same sets and clothes which were very hard to come by, but to their credit, they managed to nail almost perfectly. <laughs> because of the return of so many old actors, it's hard to distinguish between which scenes were for Ali Hatami and which were for Muhammad Mutawassalani. But we get to that a little bit later. Because of the horrific situation surrounding the movie, Mutawassalani had agreed to change the movie if they also kept his name off of it. And that's how this movie was turned into what it is. It came out in 1988 with no name on the opening credits and the poster for the writer, director, and producer. It's basically a child that nobody wants to take the custody of, and as expected, it grew up kind of messed up. <laughs> the reason the movie is messy, to put it very mildly, is that ideas that Ali Hatami was trying to express were not the same ones that Muhammad Mutawassalani was trying to express. And so the movie is very confused in its characters and its themes. It would help us immensely if we could understand what was Ali Hatami's original vision, right? Oh. You notice that we talked only about two of our three presented books. This was a birthday gift to me by a very good friend. It's, a, it's the collected works of Ali Hatami's original script that were sent for approval and or found in his belongings. It's a two-volume book, and this is the second volume. In here, we have the original script for Jafar Khan as Farang Bargashteh. Well, that is not the slam dunk that you may think. Ali Hatami was incredibly notorious for not using the original scripts. During the filming of some of his movies, as Muhammad Ali Keshavaz recalls in this book, he would change the script sometimes on the night of the shoot. And those changes were substantial and sometimes even meant the change to the whole story. So this script is not his movie. Is sort of his concept script. Also, this script mentions Don Quixote, so that is our reference quota to Don Quixote Met. I'm going to read the part that he mentions Don Quixote. Uh, okay, uh, let me see where it is. Okay, I'm gonna read the read it in Persian, and then there will be subtitles. Everyone's favorite way of telling a foreign piece of media. Jafar Khan was sagash be hamrah dai dost shabih be donkey shod va pish khidmatash dar jolay sepahi bozorg az mashinalat kishavarzi va rahsazi super modern be taraf deh dar harakat and. So yeah. Thank you Ali Hatami for giving us our Don Quixote reference. Reading the script may not give us a good view of what the movie was like, but it's a great window into what it's supposed to be. On top of that, we do have visual cues for which parts of the movie are his, because Muhammad Ali Keshavaz didn't return, and Mutawassalani added some new actors. So any part of the movie that features Keshavaz is from Ali Hatami's version, and any part that features any of the new actors is from Mutawassalani. So with that in mind and the script at hand, let's see what the story was like. The biggest thing you'll notice is the amount of visual comedy and visual gags. In order for Jafar Khan to appear as a caricature of a progressive person coming from abroad, he wears often comically impractical clothing and speaks in an incredibly over-the-top manner. He is a parody 
of the enlightened who came back spouting grand ideas with the added part that his visions for Iran are incredibly regressive. He wants to progress forward but puts aside humanity and the well-being of others in order to achieve an idea that is extremely half-baked. Like the idea of operating medical procedures on yourself. The idea sounds progressive, but it makes no sense. How are you? Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dissect it. But that is not all. In the final version of the movie, we have the grand speech in the rain, where we see the two ideals of Iranian public together. The enlightened, who is trying to just help the surface and the adoring public, who follows him without ever questioning him due to illiteracy and an overabundance of trust into the big sounding words. This comes at the end of the movie in the final version, but in the script, this is the middle of it. The third act of the script has Jafar Khan going back to using Iranian traditionalism to its max, using ideologies long abandoned because he believes if his works didn't progress when he was trying to move forward, then he's supposed to move backwards. I love this shift in the script because it gives Jafar Khan a more nuanced view other than just this guy who came back from abroad with all these foreign ideas. It makes Jafar Khan into a symbol. He becomes the ideas that the Iranian public and the Iranian culture and economy and everything can move forward if you just use something other than trying to address its problems. <laughs> Whether using foreign ideas or outdated traditionalism and smearing it on top of the society, the idea which that alone will make everything better is wrong. It's regressive. It's a very dumb idea. Which is why they asked Ali Hatami to remove it. Why? Why do I keep drinking this shit? Enlightenment in Iran has always been kind of a sore wound, and not always for the wrong reasons. Ali Hatami has been a very avid critic of the Enlightened. In his movies, you can see numerous portrayals of them as people who express great ideals, but are usually very inept in taking action for any meaningful change. This has been the case with Jafar Khan as Farang Bargeshte too. From the script and the pieces of the movie that we know of from his version, we can see a great contradiction. In the original script, the character of Dr. Khoshtel, portrayed by Arhan Saad, has a more active role in trying to mitigate the dangerous rays of Jafar Khan by going against him, not in an ideological battle, but in a human one. He doesn't attack Jafar Khan for not understanding the principles he's trying to establish. He attacks him when he starts harming the people for implementing those principles. You might think that is a minor change in the way that the movie works, but it's a huge one. Let's talk about his de facto replacement, Dr. Sharif, portrayed by Ira Gerard. He's also a guy who's been abroad and had studied medicine there, but he has returned and has taken a simple job helping people in a local hospital. What he represents and what he is, is the reason the enlightened fail. It's compliance. He attacks Jafar Khan saying that he didn't understand what he had studied and what he's doing is inhumane. But we know that. We're not idiots. So what Motivastelani is doing with this character is putting him to state the obvious and have us, the audience, trust him more. He said the thing that was obvious, so it must mean he's smart and in the right. But what else has he done? Traditionalists 
in a community like Iran love to be seen as this character. He's modern, apparently. He has studied abroad. He has all the trappings of a modern man. He's well-spoken, he's middle class, and he's kind. But he spouts the traditional ideals. You should comply with the wishes of the elders. You should try not to disturb your surroundings. When you understand the problems of the situation, you should trust in the older generation to help and mend it. If things have been like this for a long time, it probably means it should remain like that. Basically, if you go and study abroad and come back, you can be a much more progressive voice if you stay in a hospital and help people and never ask for anything more. To put it in medical terms, treat the symptoms, but never try to diagnose the disease and treat that. I don't think I need to tell you why that level of compliancy is not a good idea. But that is what traditionalism wants. You can be whatever you want if that thing is in our worldview. Don't ask why we tell you to do something. This is why Abdullah Esfandiyar's claim that the movie's rejection was due to it being just a cheap comedy rings a bit surface level. It's not crude humor, it just doesn't have the compliancy that this story should have. Basically, Ali Hatami didn't enforce the idea that Jafar Khan's father was right and Jafar Khan should have been a good little boy and listened to him hard enough. This movie is not good. And I'm not sure if Ali Hatami's original version would have been any better or not. I know from bits and pieces that it would have been interesting. To, to say the least. But that movie cannot escape the grasp of the censorship and traditionalism because Ali Hatemi took a stick and shoved it into people's comfortable holes, okay? I heard it. That was unfortunate. I, I meant to say he made people uncomfortable by probing, nope, nope, but not better. He riled people up by putting Jafar Khan as the thing that would have been any enlightened, wet, sloppy dream. I don't know what is wrong with me. It is undiagnosed. Basically, the journey that Ali Hatami and his version go through is a lot like the plot of the original play. He made a movie that was put against traditionalism. It was not a perfect movie. The biggest problem with Ali Hatami's original script is that it's very obvious, which honestly makes it weird that Muhammad Motovassalani thought he should make it even more obvious. But Ali Hatami's version has Jafar Khan as an extremist in trying to help Iran by removing its identity and trying to find answers anywhere except in current Iran. That view wasn't good for people who really wanted to portray Iran's traditionalist values as the thing that held the country together. And so he was bullied enough until he fled. The result in the play is that Jafar Khan's family never got better. In the reality, the result is yet another very mediocre film that enforces an ideal that anyone my age knows very well. Painfully. Well, happy no rules again. This was very depressing. I'm not kidding. I knew of the movie from the Muhammad Ali Keshavaz biography book. And when I read into what happened and I did my research both into Iranian history and the play, I got very depressed. We are firmly a century away from when the play was written and yet the play feels very relevant. It sucks. We are still dealing with traditionalist views in every level of our society. Just for the record, if you are the younger generation, the generation after me, don't comply. Ask questions of your elders. Maybe stand up in front of them and tell them you think they're wrong. They have a lot of power as it is. Compliance shouldn't just be given to them because they've lived longer. You can, you can sense the salt in that remark. 
I wanted this video to be short and simple, and like usual, it kind of ballooned up into a big mess that was hard to manage. If you think I managed it well enough, though, I would have to ask you to give this video a like. Drop a comment and tell me what you think of the video, both in terms of my argument and just general vibe of the video. <laughs> oh, also subscribe and share the video. YouTube really helps the videos that get a lot of engagement, and I know it doesn't feel good to hear it, but that engagement really helps me go on making these videos and exploring different media. You can also follow me over on Instagram at akamse88, because that is my main window outside of the channel itself. Hopefully my next video will be shorter, but it probably won't be, let's be honest. Though I can tell you, it's going to be a bloody ordeal. <laughs> Hope to see you here later and uh, please take care. If everything has gone according to plan, this video should be up on the 13th of Favardin, which is the last day of Nowruz. So if you are watching this on the day it came out, uh, May you have a great 15th century because it's the last youth knows and we need to start working on our usual boring lives again. <laughs> God, this was depressing. And cut. <laughs>